Okay. Yes, yes, we are hearing. All right. Welcome to the seventh installment in our series, Women Around the Rasul, Salam, hosted by the Sisters Department of the Islamic Dawah Movement. Our sessions are usually held on the third Saturday of every month at 8 p.m. on Zoom. Tonight, we'll be streaming on YouTube as well as on Zoom. Uh, to those who may have missed it, we've covered the lives of uh, Aisha Rajalahu Anha, Khadija, Nusayba bin Kaab, Ramla bin Abi Sufyan, Fatima bin Muhammad, and Asma bin Abi Bak. This series was intended to inspire us all to emulate and love those strong and pious Sahabiyat. Tonight, we will be hearing about one of the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, or mothers of the believers, and wife of the Rasul Sallam, Juwaria bint al Harith. Our presenter is Brother Amir Muhammad, Secretary of the IDM and Head of IDM's Education and Tarbiyah Department. So without further ado, I'll invite Amir to proceed with his presentation, inshallah. Assalamualaikum, Amir. Alhamdulillah, it's good to be on and it's it's good to uh, we can meet in uh, in an environmental world. Um, are safe and um, you know, we could still get to hear each other and interact with each other. So tonight, Alhamdulillah, we have the opportunity to learn about Wariya bin al Harith radiallahu ta'ala anha. And you know, there's actually not much information available about Wariya. There's actually uh, only one hadith that is narrated that tells us about her, about her characteristics and about her, um, about her, you know, her, her, her and um and so what we're going to do tonight in Shama is we are going to look at um her background the social context and how she came into in the islam into the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um we look at her situation in medina and something unique about juwaria um was that she actually came in as a prisoner of war so we'll talk a little bit about that particular concept in Islam so you could understand it. We'll talk about the marriage that happened, uh, what the father did. We'll look at a few of the hadith that she narrated. And uh, we'll spend a few minutes on a special dua that the Prophet taught her. We'll look a little bit about the explanation of that dua and we'll look at the lessons that we can learn um, from Juwariya and the, and the circumstances around her. So first we'll talk about her name. Her name was actually originally Barra bin al Harith ibn Dirar. So she was the daughter of Al Harith uh, ibn Dirar. So Barra was also the original name of one of the other wives of the Prophet Zainab. Barra comes from the same root as the word Bir, which means piety. Uh, there's a verse in Quran which is called Ayatul Bir. So I don't know if anybody could put in the chat which, uh, what is the reference for Ayatul Bir in the Quran. So I can't see the chat, but um, I hope that. Um, I hope that um, uh, Khadija and Brother Mirzani will see the, see the answer we'll look back at it, right? So let's look at her background. Um, so she was the daughter of the chief of the tribe, al Harith ibn Zirar. And she, uh, he rather, was the chief of this tribe called Banul Mustalif. Now, Banul, Banul Mustalif was a non-Muslim tribe. Um, so Banul Mustalif is like from the, the larger uh, branch or the larger tribe of Khuzar and Banul Mustalif was one of the sub-branches of Khuzar, like the Banu Hashim was a sub-branch of the Quraysh. So she belonged to this prestigious lineage. She belonged, you know, she had this, this, uh, this, this sort of royal, um, you know, personality, if you want to say that. And she was married actually to her cousin, a man by the name of uh, Mani Ibn Safwan, who was also from among the leadership of the Banu Muslim. So, how exactly did she enter the life of the Prophet? So, let's look at that. We need to look at 
the situation that existed in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, this was around the fifth year after Hijrah. Around this time, you know, there were battles, there were, there were uh, different types of war that was happening. And in this particular year, is when the battle of the, uh, with the Confederate army, or the battle of the French took place. So this was a time when the Muslims were fighting to exist. This was a time when there were people around Arabia that had the intention to oblib ob obliterate the Muslims, that obliterate Islam and to, to, you know, to take Islam out of existence for all eternity. And so the Confederate army, um, you know, for those of you who might not know, was an army that was you know, that comprised of different tribes from around, uh, around Arabia, including a, a, a Jewish tribe, from Medina who you know didn't like that the Prophet came and they were trying to get support in order to, to eliminate uh, Islam and the Muslims. So the Muslims dug a trench around the part of Medina, the only path through which this army could, um, could come. Now there was a particular uh, threat to the Muslims even though they were inside Medina protected by this trench and other things around Medina but there was a, a tribe of Jews within Medina who had signed a treaty with the Muslims to vow that they would never fight against the Muslims or would never do anything you know, military against the Muslims. And they broke their treaty. So they became a threat to the Muslims inside, um, inside Medina while this trend was protecting the Muslims from, from, um, from outside. So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to war with this particular tribe after the Battle of the Trench. Now to give you some context, because after the Battle of the Banu Faraida, the Prophet وسلم, then heard of a plan of the people of Banu Muspalif to do the same thing, to attack the Muslims. And they had this hatred, they had this animosity. They also wanted to eliminate the Muslims. So the, so the Prophet وسلم, he sent a Sahaba to investigate and to confirm. Now, this is very important. I wanted to stop and note this, right? So the Prophet وسلم, he got some information. And he didn't just immediately act on that information but he verified the information, he confirmed what, was, what he heard it was true, and then he acted on it, you know, and now, nowadays we live in a time of so much information and so much misinformation, that we receive information and we just forward it, we just send it and we just mass forward it to a number of people without verifying, without knowing if it is true, if it is correct. And sometimes we may be, we may be encouraging people to do things which, are, which is better, we may be do, encouraging people to do things which may be sure, we may be encouraging people you know, to, to develop paranoia because you are sending information without verifying it, right? So this is something, this is one of the first things we should learn from this, from this particular situation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then, you know, issued a lot to launch a surprise attack um, to the Banu Mustalik, and it's sometimes known as the Battle of Muraisiya or, Banu Mus or, or Battle of Banu Mustalik, um, because there was a pond where, the, where this tribe lived, and the name of the pond was al Muraisiya. So, the Banul Mustalik, they were caught off guard. They became very early in the morning and people were still filling water by the pond and so on. Nobody was prepared for any battle they didn't know. Uh, and so they were caught off guard. A few people, a handful of people who were able to gather their arms, they fought and then they were killed. No Muslims were killed in this battle. Now, among the people killed was uh, Juwari and his husband and her father and many of the tribe, tribes, men, the leaders, they fled. Um, away from the from the, from the, uh, the battle scene, and many prisoners of war were taken. Many hundreds of people were taken as prisoners of war, and was common at the time. So, after the battle, the lots were drawn for the women of who were the prisoners of war, and Juwariya Rajalatala Anha was assigned to a Sahabi by the name of Thabit Ibn Faiz Rajalatala Anha. Now, Thabit Ibn Faiz, just a quick, quick, some quick information about Thabit. He was known as the spokesperson for the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And a, a kind of funny incident uh, related to Thabit is that when this verse of Quran that you see here was revealed from Surah Hujarat, verse number two, where Allah SWT says, Oh, you believe, raise not your voices above the voice of the Prophet, nor speak aloud to him in, in talk as you speak aloud to one another, lest your deeds should be rendered fruitless while you proceed not. When Thabit heard this, this particular verse of Quran, he ran into a room, locked himself, and started to cry. And the reason for that was because his voice was naturally very powerful. His voice was naturally loud. You know, there are some people who, you know, they just have these strong voices whenever they speak. And so when he saw this verse, he thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about him for raising his voice because he had such a loud voice, right? But this wasn't the case. So that's just to tell you a little bit about Thabit. 
So now Jueria was assigned to Thabit, and she was now one who you would you would uh, who, who was known as the one who your right hand possessed. When you read the Quran, you often see this phrase, uh, and those who your right hand possess, those who your right hand possess. So this is she became one of those, and this gives us the opportunity to understand what was this situation, and how does Islam, you know, deal with this situation? How does Islam uh, regulate this situation? Because there there are many. Uh, misunderstandings. A lot of people uh, ask about how come Islam allowed slavery. You know how come the Prophet was alive and you know there was slavery happening. So I just want to clear this up with a few slides so that we could understand and we could leave learning from Juwaira's situation how to understand this concept properly um, in, a, in a very basic way. Now the word for this situation I put slavery in in inverted commas because the correct word in Arabic is rich. It cannot be likened to slavery that we know in our Western world. So when we hear slavery in 2021, we think about certain things. We have certain images in mind. We know certain historical information from the from what we have been taught about slavery. But it is not the same as that existed in time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rick or, or taking slaves was, was, a, was a universal practice of all the tribes um, at the time. In fact, even before that, you know, if you study Surah, Surah Yusuf, you remember when he was when he was in the well and he was removed from the well, he was taken and he was sold as a slave. So Islam was the first system which came and implemented rules that govern an arrangement that was already acceptable to everyone. Before this, the, the, the practice of slavery was uncontrolled, it was unregulated. And I just want to show you some differences mm -hmm. between before Islam and what Islam brought. So before Islam, there are many ways that people could have become slaves. Right, so you could have come trading, you could have been sold as a slave, you could have been captured and, and, and made a slave, you could have been a slave from a prisoner of war, mm -hmm. and other means as well. When Islam came, Islam regulated that. There's only one way a person could be in this situation, and this was after war, this was after battle. So Islam limited the sources of a person becoming, becoming a slave. Now, why, why should there be prisoners of war at all? Right, Sheikh Shankiti, he talks about it, and I just wanted to read this quote for you. He said, The reason why a person may be taken as a slave is him having rejected Islam and then waging war against Allah and His Messenger. If Allah enables Muslim, the Muslims who are striving and sacrificing their lives and their wealth and all that Allah has given them to make the word of Allah supreme over those who reject faith, then He allows them to utilize the enemy when they capture them, unless the ruler chooses to free them or to ransom them if that serves the interest of the Muslim. So the commander, depending on the situation, will decide whether some people should be freed, whether some people should be taken as prisoners, whether some people should be killed because of the political situation, because of the context of that particular battle. The Prophet Wasallam and Islam, and Islam on the whole talks about how Muslims should treat slaves. Right? For example, I just put a couple of hadith, the Prophet said, he who treats his slave badly will not enter paradise. And a man said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, haven't you told us that the largest number of slaves and orphans will be among the Muslim Ummah? And he said, Yes, you are to honor them and treat them like your children and feed them for more food. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever frees a Muslim slave, Allah will save all of the body parts of his, all of the parts of his body from the hellfire as he has freed the body parts of the slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about servants or slaves in Quran. In this verse in Surah Al Nisa, Allah says, Worship Allah and associate nothing with him. And Parents be good unto relatives, orphans, the needy, the near neighbor, and the far neighbor, the companion at your side, the traveler, and those whom your right hands possess. In this verse, which legislates the categories of people who receive zakat, one of them is to use the for freeing of slaves. Right? So we see in the in the in the, in the hadith and the Quran that when we use when the word slave is used or, or, or a reference is made, it is because it's a reference of kindness and honor and a way of freeing them or bringing them back to one. And I just want to show you another comparison. So if a person is, is a slave or finds themselves in that situation, how do they come out of it? Before Islam, there was no way to come out of it, except by some miracle or by death, most likely. With Islam, there are different ways. So a slave could conduct, could uh, get into a contract, which we'll see very shortly. The choice of the master, somebody could, out of you know, trying to do some good or to, to gain some reward, will be decided to free a slave. Or the Prophet also talks about expiation of sins, a person uh, and the Quran as well. So a person does a particular sin, then freeing of slaves is one of the things that a person can do to, to make up for that sin 
that was that was done. So, for example, accidental killing, breaking of fast and normal bond, giving false testimony, and uh, other situations. So, Islam limited the ways that a person could become a slave and expanded numerous ways for a person to leave this particular situation. So, when Allah SWT says, those who your right hands possess, I'm talking about the women who were uh, prisoners of war, prior to Islam, these female slaves were used in any way that the master desired. In any way, they were often actually rented out for income. So, the master would use this woman, rent her out for a night or two nights, and then she'd come back and he would receive income for this. Islam made this hal- um, haram and only allowed the person who's taking care of this, of this woman to be intimate as well. Before Islam, children who were born from this arrangement were also considered slaves, and with Islam, these children are considered the same right as the children from marriage. So I just want to note as well, Hajar alayhi salam, um, who's the mother of Ismail and Ishaq, was also a person in this particular category, right? She was a, a servant of Ibrahim and Salah alayhi salam. So just quickly, to look at a comparison, the ways to become a slave, there was many before Islam, but only now one with Islam. Ways to exit, there was only really one before Islam, and now there were many after Islam. Treatment of slaves before Islam was property uh, with Islam, it honor, kindness, and care. Children of slaves were also slaves before Islam, but with Islam had rights and marriages. The means of income for slaves, there were none, but zakah and sadaqah comprised the means of income. So, no, Alhamdulillah, you know, there's no jihad, there's no war, there are no slaves. Um, really, there's, there, these things are not really applicable in our day and age. But this is just sort of to clear, clear that concept up for us so that we can have an idea of what existed and what Islam legislated for. So let's move on to what happened to Juwayri. So she is now with uh, Thabit ibn Qais. Now, she's among the Muslims now. She's living in the house of a Muslim. She is, you know, um, she would have seen his, his behavior, his character, his ibadah, um, you know, what he does. She would have been running errands for him. You know, she would have interacted with Muslims, done business with Muslims on his behalf and so on. And she would have concluded from her observation that, you know, what she and her tribe had thought about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims were wrong. It was incorrect. So she would have seen with her own eyes that the things that she thought about Islam and Muslims were actually incorrect. And sometime during this period, she became Muslim, right? So we don't know specifically where, but we know at least before at this point, and you'll see why um, very shortly. So she became Muslim. So she goes to Thabit and she asks a particular question. She makes a request and she asks for something called Mukhatara. Now this is a contract, I mentioned a contract when I talked about ways that you know, slaves could come out of it which is a, an agreement made between the slave and the master. Um, so the slave would say, okay, I'd like to pay you $5,000 in three months. And the master will agree and said, okay, yes, you have three months, you give me $5,000 and I will free you, right? So she went to Thabit and this, is, this comes from Abu Sabbat and Surah al Nur and those who seek the contract, the emancipation from among whom your right hands possess, then make a contract with them if you know there is within them goodness and give them from the wealth of Allah with you. Right? Now, the only problem with Juwaria is that she had money, right? She had no possession. She didn't have anything really to, to, to bargain with or to get an income through. So imagine this, this, this woman, this young woman. Um, she's alone. She comes from a particular line of nobility. She has no money. She has no access to any other resources. She has no connection. She has no links. She is in distress. She's worried about the situation. And she's very young. I didn't mention it. She's very young. She's only 20 years old while she's in this situation, right? So could you imagine our sisters, you know, ourselves at 20 years old being in this social situation and having to find a way out of this particular situation? Very, very, you know, worrying, very scary, you know, when you think about ourselves having to be in this situation. So she goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she decides she would go to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for assistance. And, and this decision of her, of hers, was pivotal for her faith and the faith of all of her people who were with the Muslims at the time. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is the one who describes the meeting between Jurairiya radiallahu ta'ala anha and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very, very long time. So she says, she tells, you know, in the hadith, what is her first impression of Jurairiya. So she uses an Arabic word which means something very rare, something very unique, something you don't really see often. This is how she describes her. 
she said she was very beautiful, very, very beautiful. She was, when she spoke, when she came into the room, she was charismatic. She immediately captured, captured your attention. This is how Jewelria was. And Aisha, who herself was, was a very beautiful woman, said she was most attractive to the eye. Of course, knowing Aisha and knowing her personality, you know she would be very jealous. So what she said, what she said, what she said in the hadith is that I got upset. I got upset when I saw Jewelria come into the room, right? So, so she continues in the hadith, and Aisha describes. She then came to the Messenger of Allah asking him for the purchase of her freedom. When she was standing at the door, I looked at her with disapproval. You know, like how we would probably stoop, right? She said, I realized that the Messenger of Allah would look at her in the same way that I had looked at her. So she's saying, gosh, I know that the things I saw, the Prophet would also see. And then she said, meaning Juwairiya, said, Oh, Messenger of Allah. This is how we know that she was Muslim before she came to the Prophet because she, she, she addressed him as Rasulullah. She says, I am Juwairiya, daughter of al Harith, and something has happened to me which is not taken from me. I mean, you know my situation. You know about war, you know that I'm a, you know, I was taken as a prisoner of war. Etc. I have fallen to the lot of Tabitha and Faisal and Shamas, and I have entered into an agreement to purchase of, to purchase of my freedom. I have come to you to seek assistance for the purchase of my freedom. So she's coming to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ask, you know, Falil Blaid, Falil Helpful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a counter for both. So he says, she, Aisha Narit, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Are you inclined to that which is better? She asks, What is that message of Allah? He replied, I shall pay your price of your freedom on your behalf, and in turn, you will marry me. So she said, I shall do this. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, he was so much loved by the Sahaba that we you know he could have gone to Thabit and said, hey, bro, you know, um, I saw this, this, this uh, slave girl that you have, you know, I found her very beautiful and um, kind of interested in my and everything, you know, and, and had he done that, without doubt, Thabit would have given her up for the sake of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, the Prophet Sallallahu always demonstrated fairness and justice and equity. And what he paid for it, he paid Tabitha the price, he required a monk, and so he freed Juwaria and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married Juwaria. I just want to mention something here as well, because sometimes when we when we, we hear and we learn about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his marriages, um, you know, people tend to be so critical, especially in, in our day and age. And many people with this oral orientalist type thinking and modernistic type thinking criticize the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for his action. And we know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us in Quran that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't act on his own but through the guidance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So many people sometimes are uncomfortable with some of the marriages of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even though the people who lived around him and his own enemies were not uncomfortable with it. But we are uncomfortable with it because we are thinking about it in our present day standards. So because Juwairiya was very young and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, saw this beautiful woman, people say, well, you know, look, look at Muhammad, you know, he was, he, you know, he just saw this beautiful woman and he wanted to marry her. Well, he was human. He was human as well. And he, you know, he, he felt physical attraction like all of us would. And it is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was human that it, it is a blessing for us because him being human, he being human, makes it relatable for us. So we could we could love him more and we could understand you know the things that he did and the things that he said because he showed his humanity in many different ways. So we could it is easier to follow him uh, when he shows his humanity. And just just by the way, you know, as a reminder, he married Khadija bin Khawailid when he was 25, she was 40 years old, 15, she was 15 years older than him, and he remained married to Khadija alone for 25 years until she passed away. He was 50. And then you know you would think for those who like to attack the Prophet you know, as soon as the as soon as the, the first wife died, you know, he probably went for this young this young girl, you know. But the next person the Prophet Salah married was Sauda bin Zana, she was 50 years old. Right? So the multiple marriages of the Prophet, you know, co coincide with the mission of Islam. And many times it was for strategic reasons, and there were strategic benefits for the Ummah and for the mission of Islam. So we are always taking a seventh century situation and bringing it forward to the 21st century and applying what we know and how we behave and our context and trying to judge 
the action of that time, which is which obviously is not, it doesn't even make sense. So this is just to, to mention. And you will see some of what I say about the strategy, the strategic benefits of the marriage marriage. So from this marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha continued that she said, the people then who that the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and married to Arabia. They released the captives in their possession and set them free and said, they are the relatives of the messenger of Allah by marriage. We did not see any woman greater than Juwairiya who brought blessings to her people. 100 families of Banu Muskalib were set freed on account of Allah. So when Juwairiya became married to the Prophet وسلم, all of the Sahaba who had these prisoners of war with them, they would have said, well, these are now your relatives of the Prophet وسلم. We cannot have them in this situation. So they freed all of them. So all of the prisoners of war became freed because they were now the family of the Prophet And look at what happened as a result of that. So the effects of this marriage is that there was, free, there was freedom for over 100 households. Not only that, but the Prophet allowed the return of the spoils of war, of the booty that was taken from the Battle of Muraisiyah, from, from when they originally fought against the Banu Mustalif, he said that was to be given back to these people who were the, who were the family of Juwaria. Now, this was something absolutely unheard of in Arab culture. This was something that of, of spoils of war being given back to those who lost the battle was something that had never been done before. And so this restored the honor, this restored the pride felt by the Banu Mustalif. And it, it prevented them from having any reason to want to retaliate against the Muslims, to retaliate against the message of Allah. And so it removed the animosity, anything that they would have been harboring towards the Prophet وسلم, towards Muslims, towards Islam, it purified that, it cleansed their hearts of that. And what do you think happened when their hearts became cleansed by that? Many of them accepted Islam. Subhanallah. So look at it from a tribe who hated Islam, who hated the Prophet وسلم, who wanted them to be obliterated, is now, are now becoming Muslim. They are now becoming part of that ummah that they wanted to, to be eliminated. So the Prophet وسلم, when he married uh, Juwairiya, he changed her name from Barra to Juwairiya. Juwairiya comes from Jaria, which means little girl, and Juwairiya means it's a beautiful addition, little, little girl. The Prophet وسلم, would often change the names of people, right? So once there was a man whose name was Harub, which means war, and he changed his name to Silm, which means peace. And he often was uncomfortable with names that you know seem to kind of uh, give up some self-righteousness. So he didn't want somebody to be called righteousness, right? Which which was what Barra meant. And he said he didn't want it to be said that you know, uh, like he would go to her house and leave, and somebody asked, "Is Muhammad there?" And somebody would say, "No, Muhammad has left Barra. Muhammad has left righteousness." So he felt kind of uncomfortable with those particular names. So he, he wanted to change a name. In fact, Imam Malik and some other scholars also talked about this and recommends avoid using particular names of surahs and angels and so on when, when we are naming children, right? So this is just a, a side point. So for example, if a person, uh, let's say a person's name is uh, Yasin, which is a common name, right? So a situation may arise where you may say, shame on you, Yasin, for doing this, you know? You're a bad person, Yasin, right? So for this reason, some of the scholars said it's probably better you know, to use other means besides these things. So this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, used, uh, changed her name. I'm not saying if any name has to change her name, change her son's name, right? That's just an example. So this is just to explain um, a little bit why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose to change her name to Juwaiya. So sometime after this, her father returned. So her father came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he wants to negotiate her release. He wants to negotiate the release of his daughter. So in exchange, she brought a, a, a herd of camels, right? So he's very well off, a herd of camels, he's bringing it. This is something, you know, it's about a lot of money, a lot of resources. He comes to offer these, these, this, this herd of camels to the Prophet Interestingly, he sees two particular camels that he, he likes, you know, they are, they are very good. He puts them aside in a place called Al Afik, just outside of where the Prophet Salaam was, a little way from where the Prophet Salaam was. And he leaves them there and he goes to plead his case to the Prophet for the release of Juwaiya. When he goes to the Prophet and he says, you know, I come and give this bit of candles in exchange for the release of Juwaiya, the Prophet says, Oh, here what? I hear you. Why don't you go and ask her yourself? And if she is if she wants to leave, 
then you can keep your camels and she can leave with you. So, I mean, this is even better than what he had thought of, right? So he came with, with, with his plans to give up all his camels. And now he's been told by Prophet Salam, you know what, ask her. If she's okay, I will let you leave with all the camels. So, so he finds it a little strange. But he goes to her and he, he goes and he speaks to her and he tells her, listen, don't embarrass her. Don't disgrace us. With your answer, meaning, this is what the, this is what Muhammad Salam said, don't disgrace us with your answer. What do you choose? I choose the message of Allah. He said, give your shame. You disgrace us. Right? So he went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told, told him, you know, uh, what about the two camels he left in al -Afir? Now, when he said this, you know, Al-Harith became absolutely shocked because nobody knew about those two camels that he had left. So he knew it was only he and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knew of those particular camels. So when he when he when he realized this, he said, This man has to be the messenger of Allah. This man has to be a prophet. Muhammad وسلم, has to be the real leader. And so he, along with his two sons and those men who are coming to him, all of them at that exact point accepted Islam. SubhanAllah. And through this, you can imagine now the leader of the Banu Muslim. His family, his daughter, his son, his, his tribesmen who came with him, and all of these people who are already accepting Islam, eventually the Banu Mustalif gradually became Muslim. And what, what wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that through this marriage to Juwairiyah, a tribe of people who wanted to, to eliminate and destroy Islam and Muslims were now all Muslims and followers of Muhammad. After this, the Prophet وسلم, also asked Al Harith permission for jewelry and marriage because he was a Muslim, he was not a Dariya and so on, and uh, of course he had no objection. So, jewelry um, as a Muslim, as an individual, is not much narrated about her except that it was said that she was very knowledgeable, like many of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, um, were. She was always engaged in worship, she was always engaged in dhikr, she was very frequent in fasting, etc. etc. And we'll see some of that. Um, in a couple of the hadith. Uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, mm -hmm. he was 63, um, after he died, uh, she spent most of her time in Saudi. She didn't really come out much. She didn't really interact with many people. Um, she hardly ever left home except for those occasions when she performed Hajj. Uh, it was said that she would be mostly engaged in Ibadah, in personal Ibadah. Uh, the stipend that would be given to her by, by Bakr and by Umar, um, for the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she would take it and she would not use from it, she would give it in charity as well. She was uh, from among the last of the of the, the Umaha al who passed away. She died in the year 50 after Hijrah, during the time of Muawiyah, when Muawiyah was in charge. And she was 65 years old when she when she passed away. She was buried in Bakhti. I put a picture of Bakhti here for those of you who uh, I've never seen Bakhti. This is the graveyard right next to Masjid Nabawi, the, the, the Prophet Masjid. So, this is what it looks like inside. So, let's look at um, some hadith that are narrated by Juru Arabia, about seven in all, but I just mentioned I think, three here, uh, three or four things. Um, just for us to, to, to learn, see how we learn some of the things that we know now from Juru Arabia. She narrated that the Prophet وسلم, came to her one day on a Friday while she was fasting. And he said, Wait, were you fasting yesterday? And she said, No. He said, Okay, are you fasting tomorrow? She said, No. He said, We'll break your fast. Right? So it's just through this hadith and others that we learn that you should not single out Friday as a day of fasting when you are fasting nothing fast, right? When you are fasting optional fast, right? So this is one of the um, sources that we learn that particular um, thing from. Another hadith, she said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to her and said, you know, I'm hungry. Is there anything to eat? She said, yeah, Messenger of Allah, I swear by Allah, there is no food with us except a bone of a goat, which my freed maid servant gave to me, which was given as sadaqah. Upon this, he said, bring that to me, so the sadaqah has reached its destination. It's a few, a few things you can learn from this, but one in particular I want to mention quickly is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Anbiya, they would not eat from what is given as sadaqah, right? So, Sometimes people would give, let's say, a, a, a bunch of dates to the Prophet as sadaqah. He would never eat from it. He would give the Sahaba, those who are poor, etc. 
or he would never eat from it. So if somebody would come to give him a gift, then he would partake from it, right? So the Ambiya, they aren't allowed to eat from charity that is given um, to people. But even though the charity was given to Juwairiya, she is now gifting it to the prophets of the Lord, right? So the, so the same thing that was originally uh, something that was sort of power when it changes ownership can now become a gift, right? So this is why he, um, he partook. But you know, take a note of Allah's messenger who has nothing to eat except the bone of a goat, right? Sometimes we eat it in our wedding and we get a bone of a goat and this was the state of the best of all humans. And this is the this is the hadith I want to spend a little bit of time on, inshallah. Um, so she said in another hadith, the Prophet came out from my apartment, from my, my apartment in the morning as I was busy in performing for them. Came back after work for her time and he found me sitting there. So he said, Are you still in the same position as I left you? And I said, Yes. He said, Thereupon the Prophet said, I recited four words three times after I had left you. While you were making dhikr, I left school. I said four words. I said it three times. And if these things that I said, if these four words said three times, are to be weighed against all you have recited this morning, these will be heavier. SubhanAllah. So he's saying, I just said four things three times, and that is equal or heavier than all of what you just said between Fajr to Zohar. How many hours of that? SubhanAllah. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at this particular dua. Many of us, or some of us may know it already. It has to be said in the morning. And the dua is Subhanallah wa bihamdihi adada khalqihi wa ridha nafsihi wa zinata arushi wa midada kalimatihi. Right? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi adada khalqihi wa ridha nafsihi wa zinata arushihi wa midada kalimatihi. Three times it's said in the morning. Right? And it means Glory be to Allah, praise be to Him by the number of His creation, by the greatness of His pleasure, by the weight of His throne, and by the extent of His weight. So I just want to look a little bit, dive in a little bit, just a touch on a little bit of what we what we do, our means, some of the rules, etc. And Sheikh Asad helped me out with this. So let's look at it. Subhanallah, will be handy. It was praise, right? So Subhanallah means Allah is far away from any perfection, right? Subhanallah, normally when we translate it, you know, Things that we see, we see glory be to Allah. But subhanAllah really means to, to affirm that Allah has no imperfection, right? Allah has no defect, right? So we are glorifying Allah by negating any defect or any negative characteristic from Him while affirming His praiseworthy, his praiseworthy attributes, perfection for Him as befits Him, right? So this is what subhanAllah he means, right? When we say subhanAllah, this is what it means that we, we are negating anything negative and we are glorifying Allah for His perfect attributes. For the hamdihi and praise be to him. This means we, we praise Allah, we show love for him and glorify him by remembering those attributes of, of perfection and by remembering all of the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And then the next phrase, adada khaltihi, by the number of his creation. Now I found this, I find this dua is so interesting and it's so deep. Um, so let's see what, what these phrases mean. Adada khaltihi, by the number of his creation. What is meant here? is that Allah deserves repeated glorification and praise to the extent of the number of his creation. Now, what is the number of Allah's creation? This is an inconceivable number, right? I mean, everything that is not Allah is his creation, right? So everything that is existent that we know of and that we've never known of from the beginning of time until the end, all of that is Allah's creation. So when we say this, it means the person is saying and he's declaring that Allah deserves to be glorified and praised this number of times, which is a number that is that is you know unimaginable. And the next phrase, what we do by the greatness of his pleasure. The pleasure of Allah is an attribute of Allah, and all of his attributes are complete and are perfect. So the greatness of Allah and the magnificence of his pleasure has no limit. So when we recite this dhikr, we are saying that Allah deserves to be praised and glorified in a manner that is as great and magnificent as his perfect attributes of pleasure. And then the Prophet said, وَزِينَةَ arushi," By the weight of his throne. So the throne is the greatest and heaviest of the creations of Allah. And so when we see this, this person is declaring that Allah deserves to be praised and glorified, such that if it could be weighed or measured, it would outweigh the throne of Allah. So when we summarize these three phrases, by the number of his creations, um, the number of words. This is what this phrase is talking about. 
what we don't not say, but the greatness of his pleasure is talking about the qualities of his of glorification. And then when we say was Zina Ta'arushihi, the weight of his throne, so talking about the weight and the measure of glorification. So one is number, which is too big to, to count. One is, is the is the quality which is, is too great to understand. And one is the weight of these of this glorification that Allah deserves, which is something that cannot be enumerated either. So it means that Allah's you know, Allah's glorification, He deserves so much of His. He can't put a number of things. He cannot count it. He cannot enumerate how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves to be praised. In the last phrase, we only that, that kalimati, by the extent of His words, this means it encompasses the previous three things and also surpasses them because the words of Allah are infinite in number, they are infinite in perfection, are infinite in completeness. And an infinite in measure. And this is what Allah SWT says in the end of Surah al kahf the second to last verse. Allah says, See, if the sea will ink for writing the words of my Lord, the sea will be exhausted before the words of my Lord were exhausted, even if we brought the light of it as a supplement. Even if you use all of the water that exists on earth to write the words of Allah, it would be exhausted before the words of Allah could be written, even if another one like it was to be brought and used again. So this is the dua again. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi adada khaltihi wa rida nafsihi wa zinata arushihi wa midada kalimatihi. So I, I asked Sa Khadija if she could put this dua in the chat so you can take it, you can download it, you can send it to you. Can, you can look at it online as well, but please learn it and use it. You know, if it is one thing that we can take away from Juaria and the session that we attended tonight on Juaria, we can implement and improve our lives through it, it would be this dua and learning this dua. It's very easy to learn. It's very rhymy, right? So you can you can learn it easily and you can memorize it. And please use it, inshallah, three times in the morning. So I want to close now with just summarizing some of the lessons that we learned from the area, from the little that we know about her. Uh, uh, what can we say? What can we take away from her? Just for a few minutes and then, and then we'll end. First and foremost, of course, was her dedication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the few things that we know from the limited hadith about Tana characteristics. And, you know, it reminds us, or her life reminds us that the success, our success, is built upon our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qadda aflaha man zaka in surah dua, in surah al-shams. Right? So the, the, the success in our lives and for our lives to go well, it is related, it is directly proportional to the, uh, to the, 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 the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we, when we study the lives of the Sahaba, especially those who are closest to the, um, the, who are closest to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will see that this is something that is common to, that is common to all, of, all of them in how they live their lives and in the way that they, they implemented their connection to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this is something um, that is, you know, we really have to try to implement in our lives because the, the dhikr of Allah is not something that takes a lot of time, right? Just say a dua in the morning takes a few seconds, right? And all of us are busy. All of us, you know, we hardly have time to do the things we want to do. But these very simple, basic things only require a little bit of our time, a little bit of dedication for it to become like, like you know, a muscle memory almost. Um, this is something we should really make a staple uh, as our spiritual nutrition. Uh, Juaria was strong. She was independent. She was outspoken, you know, because she was only 20 years old. And she went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she was very clear about her worth as an individual. Right? She went to him and she says, you know who I am. You know my situation. You know, I come from so and so background. She, she was clear about what she was worth as an individual, as a woman, as a woman. And she had the courage to go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ask for help, to ask to negotiate her, 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 situ, uh, her condition. So she wasn't shy, you know, she wasn't afraid, she was only 20 years old. You know, and she wasn't afraid to go to the, to the, to the commander of the army, the leader of the Muslims, the, 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 the president of Medina, if you want to call it that, to speak to him and to speak her case. Because this was the, this was the metal of the, of the people who are wronged the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the metal of the kind of characters that remained in history for us to learn from. That they were not, they were not shy. They were confident about who they were. They were confident about, you know, the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them, the worth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. And so we should learn from Juwairiya. We should be confident about who we are. We should be confident about what we stand for 
and we shouldn't be afraid to, to show what we are. And sometimes as Muslims, you know, we we like to avoid taking the front. You know, we say, oh, that, you know, let somebody else do it, and and you know, we should be humble and modest. Yes, of course, we don't take, we don't go to the front, you know, to show off, and we don't go to the front for for, for uh, reasons except that we are sincere to want to make things better and, and, and so on. But we should not be afraid to speak. When the situation requires us to speak to see what is right, we shouldn't be ashamed to stand up for our tawhid, for our belief, for our iman. We shouldn't be, you know, we should be at the front and the, for the sake of Allah, we should always be in the leadership for mankind, for the wealthy of mankind. Allah tells us it and says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'muruna bil ma'aruf wa tanhawna ala minka wa tukhmuna billah. But you are the best nation producer, as an example, for mankind. You enjoy what is right, forbid what is wrong, and believe it. And so from her example as well, we see that she was from among the leadership of her people. And in requesting her freedom, she knew that it would, it would, it would positively affect the fate of her people. So she had a sense of responsibility for the people to whom she belonged. She had a sense of responsibility for the trust that she was given to be a leader of, that, of, of, of those people. So we learn from Juwairiya that as a Muslim, our concern is not just with ourselves and our inner circles, but our concern as a Muslim should always still be with the state of our communities, with the state of our neighborhood, with the state of our nation, with the state of mankind, these are things that should be of concern to us as well. And so this is a reminder for us that Islam came to perfect human living. It didn't come to be restricted to our homes and to books and to inside of the masjid. Yes, our own condition, our own hereafter is priority number one for us. We must see our road bigger than ourselves. And this is exemplified in all of the lives the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Surah Al-Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Nuh alayhi salam said, Ya qawmi inni lakum nadhirun mudin. Ya qawmi, oh my people. He didn't say, oh people, I am to you a clear one. He said, oh my people. He took a sense of responsibility, a sense of ownership for the people in which he lived. In the very first instruction Allah gives in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nas, he doesn't say, oh, oh, you believe. The first instruction, oh, mankind, it is for everybody. So these are some of the things that we learn from Juwairiya, some of the things from the limited information, a type of personality she had and how we could benefit from it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the lives of the Sahabiyat, that we could learn from them so that we could benefit from them. And their personalities are so you know, diverse. There are so many different personalities that we can... We can see ourselves in, in different ones, especially our sisters. And so all of us can learn to strive to adopt the qualities and make them the best of the best. And these women, like Juwairiya, they were good enough for the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, in Surah Al-Nur, good women are for good men and good men for good women. So these women were so good. And you can see why they were so good, that they were good enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger. So we try as best as we could to emulate, to emulate these qualities. So, this is a summary of what we talked about tonight. We talked about uh, where we had background, social context at the time, her situation in Medina, uh, being a prisoner of war, what that means, a marriage with the Prophet ﷺ when her father returned. We talked about some of the ahadith that she narrated, and we spent a few minutes talking about that very special dua that I'm suggesting we all learn, and then I ended with some of the lessons that we can learn um, from her. So this is a, a, a quick summary of Juwariya bin al Harith. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all of us and may give us the tawfiq to be able to benefit from these lessons and to be able to implement um, some beneficial changes. And shukran jazakum Allah khair. Aku wa qawli hadha wa astaghfir Allah li wa lakum wa lisa ila muslimin an ikul idam fa astaghfiru inna wa astaghfiru. Shazakallahu khair al-Amir. We'd like to invite anyone who has any questions for Dr. Or you can put it in the chat. So there's one raised hand. Sister Anne, you can go ahead. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Um, Can you say that um, the Wairia, Aradi Allah, and her uh, motive for marriage, prophet of was a, a means of getting her people freed. Uh, those who were in bondage, those who were to enslaved, use that as a means to get her people freed. Well, um, I don't know that 
I don't know that that was her intention. I mean, we can't say what her intention was, but we know from her first um, uh, question to the Prophet is that she asked for help for her own freedom. Um, so that was that, that. That is what makes me what makes her intention clear. And then when the offer of marriage came from the Prophet perhaps she would have known that had she said yes, it would have benefited her people. So Allah knows best. But um, what we know is that her intention for seeing the Prophet was to secure her own, her own release. And perhaps afterwards she would have tried to help and negotiate on behalf of, of, her, of her family. Thank you. Brother Sidi, can mute and go ahead, please? Mm. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum. Uh, there's a hadith by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who states that um, no, this, 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 um, the ties of kinship will not enter paradise, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I was always taught that uh, when embr- as a revert, somebody who embraces Islam, you don't have to change your name to a Muslim name legally because your name has nothing to do with your belief, right? right. Uh, but we see here in Juaria's life that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam changed her name from Barra mm-hmm. to Jory, right? Um, mm-hmm. Could you um, elaborate or, you know, help? Just give us four ups, uh, just give us some clarification, please. Right. So you should not change your name if it will, um, um, if it will affect basically knowing what your lineage is, right? So he didn't, he didn't have to change the lineage, which is Al Harith, right? So it will always be known that she's the daughter of Al Harith. Right, so in cases where reverts, you know, have names that um, are not, you know, names that have uh, a bad meaning or something that is, you know, uh, adverse to Islam, and there's a need to change one's name, especially the one last. So in cases where a person may have a name that, you know, maybe something, you know, along the lines of shirk or something, and somebody may want to change any name of the people, so going to add anything to it. So this is not the only name that the Prophet recommended to change, uh, but I'm here, I'm just adding. There are other people who came to the Prophet Sallallahu and they took Shahada and they had names that had bad meanings and the Prophet recommended change it to Abdul Rahman, change it to this, change it to that. But the, the, the reason for not changing names is, is really for lineage. But it's not haram for somebody to change their name from John to Yahya, from, from, from Hari to something else in Islam. It's perfectly permissible. The lineage is the, is the issue here and... Um, and uh, you're not changing a lineage, but changing a name is not that it is haram, but keeping the lineage is what is important. Any other questions? All right, Jessica, let me try and share. All right, if there are no more questions, we'd like to thank Amir a thorough and enlightening session. Uh, we hope that it was a beneficial, beneficial session and that you might share this story with those who may not have heard it and who may not have heard about Juwaria before to make sure and share that dua of Juwaria as well. This was a story of a prisoner of war to one who was promised Jannah. And it is a story of hopelessness to one of great hope. So we would like to thank you for taking the time out tonight on a Saturday holiday for joining us. Our next session, inshallah, will be on the 17th of July, 2021. And our Sahabia will be Um Sulaim in Midhan. We look forward to seeing you next month, inshallah. And please share the invitation with your family and friends. And we look forward to seeing you next month, inshallah. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.